Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Lifespan Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. Our Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference is over, but the research and developments continue. Here's a summary of what happened in August. Starting off with our research roundup. Published in GeroScience, a groundbreaking study from the renowned Convoy Lab has confirmed that plasma dilution leads to systemic rejuvenation against multiple aspects of aging in human beings. This paper takes the view that much of aging is driven by systemic molecular excess. Signaling molecules, antibodies, and toxins, which gradually accumulate out of control, cause cells to exhibit the gene expression that characterizes older cells. While the bloodstreams of old and young mice have been joined in previous experiments with substantial effects, this approach is not necessary for human beings. Instead, this paper focuses on therapeutic plasma exchange, a procedure that simply replaces blood plasma with saline solution and albumin. This procedure has already been used to address the systemic problems associated with autoimmune and neurological disorders, including Alzheimer's, and even the lingering aftereffects of viral infection. In this study, a total of eight people had their blood biomarkers assessed and were then given therapeutic plasma exchange. While not everyone benefited as much or in the same ways, the data showed increases in many fundamental biomarkers of immune function. Multiple ratios of immune cell counts returned to levels seen in younger people, and the counts of B cells and natural killer cells generally improved. Meanwhile, biomarkers of cellular senescence and oxidative DNA damage showed decline. Overall, the data showed a significant trend towards youthful expression. Further analysis showed a possible anti-cancer effect through the reduction of cancer pathways, as well as a decrease in proteins associated with Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Whether or not these results will hold true in a larger study, however, remains to be seen, but there is strong evidence for such a study to be conducted. In a randomized, controlled trial, scientists have shown that sauna and exercise might have a synergistic, beneficial effect on cardiovascular health and cholesterol levels. Sauna bathing has been credited with many health benefits, predominantly for the cardiovascular system. However, the actual evidence has been limited to just a few studies, most of them populational. One non-randomized clinical trial found that a sauna session decreases blood pressure and improves several other aspects of cardiovascular function. Another intervention that does that is exercise, and those two often go together, such as in a gym. This new randomized controlled trial set out to investigate whether exercise and sauna can work together to improve cardiovascular health. It included 47 participants in their 40s and 50s with low physical activity levels and at least one traditional cardiovascular risk factor. The participants were randomly assigned to three groups, the control group, the exercise group, and the exercise and sauna group. The primary outcomes were blood pressure and cardiorespiratory fitness, and the secondary outcomes were fat mass, total cholesterol levels, and arterial stiffness. The trial duration was eight weeks. The exercise and sauna groups worked out three times a week for an hour, and the sauna group followed that by a 15-minute visit to a sauna. As expected, the exercise group surpassed the control group in cardiovascular fitness and weight loss, but there were no significant improvements in blood pressure and total cholesterol. Things were slightly better in the exercise plus sauna group, which showed a statistically significant improvement over the exercise group in VO2 max, systolic blood pressure, and cholesterol levels. One limitation that makes interpreting the results harder is the absence of a sauna-only group. Since sauna use alone has been found to decrease blood pressure, it is not possible to say whether the effect in this trial was additive, especially given that the exercise-only group fared no better in terms of blood pressure than controls. However, previous sauna-only trials have shown a more modest effect on blood pressure, so some synergy might have been at play in this new trial. Despite its limitations, this randomized, controlled trial is one of the most robust studies on the health effects of sauna bathing. It mostly agrees with previous research and hints at the existence of a synergistic effect between sauna and exercise. While these results are not definitive and more research is needed, they certainly give a good reason not to skip the sauna next time you visit your gym. 
Researchers have shown that over 44% of cancer deaths worldwide can be attributed to preventable risk factors, including behavioral and environmental ones. This paper, based on the 2019 results from the Global Burden of Diseases, Injuries, and Risk Factors study, is quite comprehensive and encompasses 204 countries and territories, practically the whole world, and accounts for sex, age, and national development levels. The report provides some interesting geographical and socioeconomic insights. Countries with a high socio-demographic index seem to suffer from much higher cancer burdens, accounting for over 25% of all cancer deaths, despite hosting only 13% of the global population. However, on the region and country levels, the situation becomes more complex. The overall number of cancer deaths grew by over 20% between 2010 and 2019, which can be attributed to population growth and aging. While the global age standardized rates of risk factor related cancer deaths actually decreased by nearly 7%. This means that in any given age group, the prevalence of cancer declined. Some risk factors became more prevalent than others. The single highest increase was in deaths related to metabolic risks, especially to high body mass index. On the other end of the spectrum, there was a 10.5% decrease in cancer deaths related to air pollution including a drastic 35.5% decrease in deaths related to household air pollution from solid fuels. This data is not hard to decipher. Particulate air pollution has been in free fall globally, and poverty has been declining too, enabling millions of people to switch from using solid fuels to less harmful ways of heating and cooking. However, prosperity brings along the availability of unhealthy food and the obesity epidemic. Occupational risk factors, such as exposure to industrial carcinogens, declined by 11.4%, indicating improvements in work environments. Behavioral risk factors, such as smoking and alcohol consumption, took a plunge as well. Clearly, humanity is doing something right and something wrong. As more people are lifted from poverty around the world, and new technologies spread, some risk factors for cancer are likely to keep declining. On the other hand, due to the same reason, abundance-related risk factors will likely become more prevalent. That's it for our research roundup. You can find more on these and other stories on our website at lifespan.io forward slash roundup. New episodes of Lifespan News have been released, including an episode exploring the newly launched Longevity Prize, which seeks to accelerate progress in longevity research through financial incentives for proposals, experiments, and collaborations, and another on a recent study that was able to revive cells and tissues in a pig that had been dead at room temperature for an hour, raising questions about when exactly life ends and whether or not medical science can continue to push back those boundaries. Lifespan News also covered the longevity summer camp. Here's a deeper dive into that. Recently, somewhere between the old gold mining town in Nevada City and the infamous Donner Pass, a unique gathering took place. Leading longevity experts and company builders convened with promising young minds and successful professionals in other fields to discuss how we could accelerate longevity technology and make it widely available. And as an attendee, I'll give you some insight into who was there, what was discussed, and how you can get involved and make a difference. This four-day event, dubbed the Longevity Summer Camp, featured intensive small group workshops and breakout sessions led by subject matter experts. Examples include workshops on reprogramming, led by Jay Sarkar of Turn Biotechnologies, brain aging, led by Kristen Glorioso of NeuroAge Therapeutics, damage repair, led by Matthew O'Connor of Cyclarity Therapeutics, and genetic medicine, led by Matt Schultz of Oshin Biotechnologies. And when they weren't hosting their own sessions, they were participating in the workshops of others. Also gathered were attendees from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. As you would expect, there were a number of people with expertise in biology and medicine, but there was also a large focus on computer science and machine learning, possibly in part due to the camp's proximity to the Bay Area. Others came from the worlds of investment and company building, policy and advocacy, robotics and automation, and math and physics. Most of the attendees came from North America, while others traveled from as far away as Indonesia. With this diversity of experiences and viewpoints, the event sought to break down barriers and eliminate the silos that exist in many other industries. Something that needs to be understood, and that was reinforced during this event, is that yes, there is a lot of money to be made in longevity technology, but there are things much more important than being first. 
someone else making a scientific breakthrough that extends lifespan and health span is still in the best interest of you and those you care about. The sooner we can make these technologies available, the more lives we can improve and extend. And that is what is important, so collaboration is key. The retreat was put together by Less Death, a new organization designed to support the growth and effectiveness of the longevity industry, largely by building pathways and systems to enable new people to enter the field and make a positive impact. Sponsors include Open Cures, VitaDAO, AgelessRx, and Lifespan.io. Because of the physical limitations of the event location, and to preserve the impact of the workshops and small group sessions, in-person attendance was capped and those who wished to attend had to apply and be selected. However, one of my goals in attending the event was to help scale the impact and make sure that the benefits and knowledge gained spread beyond those that were there in person. Something that was clearly expressed there is that everyone has a role to play in advancing longevity science and technology. Even if your background is not in biology, or computer science, or business, you have a place in this community. If nothing else, these organizations need your advocacy and your support. The importance of messaging and having conversations with your friends and family came up numerous times during the workshops. The science won't really go anywhere unless the public, the business community, and governments are on board and enable that to happen. Getting that buy-in is crucial, and not having it would be a major roadblock that could end up costing lives. Other roadblocks and bottlenecks were also discussed, and new ideas were brainstormed. Among the topics that came up, the fact that aging is not considered a disease, which could be addressed through lobbying and advocacy. The bandwidth limitations of those working in the field, which could be addressed through lab automation, simulation, and the use of digital twins. A focus on the precautionary principle rather than the proactionary principle, which could be addressed by drawing attention to the definite harm caused by inaction, in addition to the possible harm caused by action. And the cost of lab equipment and supplies, which could be addressed with a sharing or leasing program, or with DIY or hacked versions. These would be great areas for people who want to make an impact in longevity to get involved. The conversations that began in the forests of California at the Longevity Summer Camp are continuing, and I don't imagine it will be long until the connections that were made and the seeds of ideas that were planted begin to bear fruit. To learn more about Less Death and their events, and to support the sponsors, you can visit lessdeath.org. When there's more to share, we'll have it for you here. So please subscribe so you don't miss out. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and we'll see you next time on Lifespan News. You can find these videos and many more on the Lifespan News YouTube channel. In August, Life Noggin explored the environmental risks associated with landfills, what happens inside your body when you're drunk, and what happens to your brain on magic mushrooms. Here's a bit of that last one. Hey there, welcome to Life Noggin. While they may look like any ordinary mushroom, magic mushrooms are very complex. They include about 180 mushroom species that contain the psychoactive chemical psilocybin. When ingested, psilocybin is converted by the body to psilocin, which causes hallucinogenic or psychedelic effects, including changes in perception, mood, and thought, and could even be used to treat mental disorders. Depending on a variety of factors, including the strength of the mushroom, amount consumed, and the person's size, the mind-altering effects can last anywhere from four to six hours. These chemicals have a similar molecular structure to serotonin, which is used by your body to deliver messages between nerve cells and plays a role in many important functions like mood, sleep, and digestion. Because these are so similar, psilocin binds to these same receptors, but it's the activation of one of these receptors in particular, 5-HT2A, that causes the trippy effect which can include a more open mind, an intense sensory experience, and hallucinations. 5-HT2A are widely found in the cortex, the area of the brain responsible for reasoning and rational thought, and they themselves are associated with the regulation of mood, imagination, and perception. Some research has also found that psilocin affects another part of the brain called the default mode network, which becomes active when your mind wanders during introspection. The scientists responsible for this study believe that psilocin interferes with the neural connections here, forcing the brain to make new, unusual connections 
connections that result in a fragmented sense of self. This rewiring of the brain is helping scientists treat mental health disorders that are marked by fixed patterns of thinking like depression. One clinical trial even found that psilocybin-assisted therapy can alleviate major depressive disorder symptoms, in some cases for at least a year. Scientists are also researching its effects on OCD, addiction, and end-of-life anxiety. Of course, this is all in a research setting, and like any drug taken recreationally, magic mushrooms can pose a serious health risk and in some cases be life-threatening. If too much is taken, you can overdose and experience vomiting, psychosis, seizures, and even end up in a coma. Or you can have a negative reaction known as a bad trip, where you may see a really unpleasant hallucination or feel panic or fear. People who don't have a support system around them can find themselves in a pretty dangerous and scary situation. So please act responsibly and leave the mind-altering medication and substances to professionals. You don't want to risk having those issues I previously mentioned. You also don't want to risk getting misidentified poisonous ones or any mushrooms laced with something really bad. You can find more Life Noggin videos and episodes of Science to Save the World on their YouTube and Facebook pages. Finishing things up with some news nuggets. Vita Dow has awarded $253,000 to fund the Apoptosense project, which focuses on removing dysfunctional cells and allowing healthy cells to continue to operate. Vita Dow has also voted to fund a periodontal disease project to the sum of $300,000 via an IP NFT. Periodontal disease affects more than 47% of adults aged 30 and over. For people over 65 years of age, that number rises to over 70%, making periodontitis one of the most commonly observed age-related illnesses. There are a number of great events coming up, including SENS Research Foundation's Ending Aging Forum from September 2nd to 3rd, Longevity Summit Dublin from September 18th, to 20th, and the Longevity Investors Conference from September 28th to 30th. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related diseases. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Mm -hmm.